you may have heard a little chatter in the booth a, a few moments ago when our guest from Comedy Central was here. I'd never seen anything like it, but we actually had uh, what appears to be a delegate or someone in the stands who was uh, who, who was reaching up and uh, and poking uh, our guest. If we have that shot, I'd love to I'd love to show it. But it was right over the uh, right over the other side of the sign. Someone was was reaching up. That's how close we are. You can see us from behind right now. So just imagine there over the left of the uh, uh, of the sign is exactly where the poking happened here. It's, uh, it is, uh, but to, to be fair to the delegate, I mean, this is this is the tough part about being in this booth right now, which is, we unlike many booths, we do not have a soundproof barrier here, so you can get the ambient sound. Of course, that means that they can hear us too, and there was a particularly emotional moment, so we definitely apologize that. Oh, so see, you can see us. We can put our hand through there. Look at that. That's right. There it's, we are. We just went right in the there. convention, out of the convention, into the convention, out of the convention. That's right. All right. All right. We're joined now by the senator from Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Huh. I've heard of. I don't know what's going on in Wisconsin. That, that, that's generally a applause line around here. I, so. I, I was yeah. going to say, I thought Wisconsin <laughs> got, got elevated. Now you get four senators. Is that what I heard? I, I, is that part of the platform no, we're, now? We're, sti we're sticking with two. Two governors? I don't know what else you can do. Ron Johnson, senator from Wisconsin. Thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. So tell us, what is in the, the lakes of Wisconsin these days that you're reading Republican? Like you are. Well, Carnes, the chairman, uh, um, Chairman Priebus says it's in the beer. <laughs> okay. But, well, now, the brats, yeah. what, what's happening in Wisconsin is, is leadership. It, it's kind of the missing ingredient that, that we're not seeing here in Washington. You know, we've actually had ele elected officials that are governing as they campaigned, that are actually acknowledging the problem. And let's face it, that's always the first step at solving a problem. And then making some tough decisions, making tough votes, and actually fixing the problem. And here's the real key is when Governor Walker and our state legislator, legislators did that, the voters then supported them with their vote. And so that's and how that works. That's how it works. And, and, yeah. and tell you, the reason that's important is Governor Walker was closing a $1.8 billion a year budget deficit. Now, it sounds like a lot. On the federal basis, we've been grappling with $1.3 trillion. I mean, on a national basis, the, our, our problem is almost a thousand times worse, so we actually are going to need elected officials that have a little bit of courage, but also understand that the voters of America will stand behind them if they have that courage to tackle these problems. All right, you were part of the vaunted class of 2010, the Tea Party class, as it's called. And, you know, this was really the first convention where the Tea Party had a role to play. Do you feel like that you've seen the Tea Party influence in this convention? I've, I've seen it throughout the Republican Party. If you think about it, you know, I went there to be a, a, an ally of people like Tom Coburn and Jim DeMint. Uh, to, in some areas, they were somewhat lonely figures there. But we've grown that core group of pretty strong fiscal conservatives quite dramatically, not only in the Senate and in the House. And when we get in there, and when we start influencing policy, which we've already done, it does tend to shift our entire conference to the right, and I think that's a good thing. So this platform right now, especially when you w heard what Paul Ryan was talking about, and maybe what we'll hear from Mitt Romney, you think has a has a serious Tea Party imprint? I believe so, because what are the main themes? What, what are the big issues? We have to stabilize our debt and deficit. We have to target all of our legislation toward economic growth. I mean, the number one component of a solution here is economic growth. So we can't be increasing taxes on people. There's, that is what the Tea Party, tax enough already. We don't believe by increasing tax on the American public, on the American job creators, that helps economic growth or create jobs. Uh, we're all about in the Tea Party rating and regulation so the business people are actually able to operate, you know, without having those, that burden of regulatory uh, regulations on them. We're about using America's energy resources. That, that'd, be a, that'd be a real good thing, by the way. You take a look at where they're doing that in North Dakota. There's virtually no unemployment at all in North Dakota. That's right, at least unemployment in the nation right now. One of our previous guests told us, though, the words Tea Party not uttered on the podium, uh, on the stage at, at all this week. Is that surprising to you to learn? Not really. Listen, in Wisconsin, I basically sprang from the Tea Party. The Tea Party recognizes that in order to get accomplish their goals, uh, we have a two-party system here you got to choose sides. It's obvious which side the Tea Party is going to align themselves with in its Republican Party. So the Tea Party has moved from a real grassroots effort. It hasn't left that behind, but they certainly moved in to the mainstream political party system, the Republican Party. And again, we're, we're basically revitalizing that party. We're, we're turning that party to reflect more of those Tea Party values. Let's talk a little about your state and, and its, its place now as a battleground, which not long ago people s would say, Wisconsin, forget it, that's a dark blue state, don't even compete there. Uh, and yet, 
we've seen the polls, they're moving a little bit, but we haven't seen the campaigns really engage there. When do you expect to see that the ads are going to begin and that the, the two campaigns are really going to start to make their cases in your state? Well, I don't know. You would, you would have had been at the Welcome Home Rally for Paul Ryan where 14,000 uh, supporters came out in Waukesha uh, to welcome him home. I've been on the bus tour twice now in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, people ask me, is it in play? Of course it's in play. Because the people of Wisconsin, I think generally in, in America, certainly upper Midwest, we're fiscally conservative. We have this common sense notion that government ought to live within its means. I mean, we have to do that in our household budgets. Those need to be balanced. We think government ought to balance its budget as well. So when the people of Wisconsin saw President Obama's policies that have just utterly failed, but his policies resulted in just this mountain of debt, um, they were appalled by it. And so you have to ask yourself, what, what's changed since 2010 when we turned that blue state red? Well, the very unpopular health care law that I ran on to repeal and the debt and deficit, we're only that much closer to implementing that law, and we've added an additional $2.5 trillion to our nation's debt. This is true, but the popularity of Congress, controlled by Republicans, also, of course, b plummeted. There, there, there is only the House that is controlled by <laughs> Amy. The reason we have a do-nothing Congress is yeah. because I serve in the do-nothing Democrat Senator Harry Reid Senate. When you are controlled by one party in the Senate, which of course you always are, but the party that controls sets the agenda. The Senate has refused to pass a budget in over three years. We've, we've done virtually nothing since but, I've arrived. But do you think that that debt ceiling fight that was engaged in at the end of last year took a toll on Republicans and the Republican image? I don't believe so because what ended up happening there is nothing. When, when the public, when the voters were crying for serious action, Washington delivered nothing. So again, here we are two years later. As I described, we've added another $2.5 trillion to the backs of our children and grandchildren. The voters are every bit as, as demanding of real progress, real solutions. And that's really what Governor Romney and Paul Ryan represent. Serious individuals dedicated to offering serious solutions. Uh, so, Senator, I want to ask you, is there a secret to the Paul Ryan message? Do you hear, do you hear something different in his speech as a, as a, as a fellow Badger stater than, than we do up here in, in the booth or that others in, in other parts of the country may hear? Well, certainly what I hear is that Republicans, Paul Ryan, Governor Romney, are concerned about every American. Our concern is such that we want to make sure that every American has the opportunity to build a good life for themselves and their family. And the way we believe America has delivered on the idea and promise of this nation is through individual initiative, freedom, or free enterprise system, not by growing government. Take a look at any economic system in the world that has relied on government control over, over people's lives and over the economy. They simply haven't worked. Take a look at the Soviet Union. Look at Venezuela or how about the island paradise of Cuba. Those systems do not work. America's system has worked. We're 5% of the world's population, and yet we produce over 20% of the world's goods. That is what the free market capitalist system has, has uh, uh, produced. All, All right. right. One thing I need, I need to ask you, I asked Governor Walker this the other day, if Republicans are to win Wisconsin, how do they win it? So tell me, the, on election night, what are those counties that we need to be watching to say, if this county goes Republican, that's it, you're going to well, win? Just take a look at the first district that Paul Ryan yeah. represents. When President Obama won that district last, last presidential election, Paul Ryan carried it with 64% of the vote. In the election that I ran in two years ago, Paul won with 68% of the vote. Now, so, so it's all going to come down to Kenosha. I, I was, well, Kenosha that is area, yeah. that, that first district. And, you know, that's, that's an awful lot of votes right there in a close state. That could definitely tip the balance. But, again, I won by six percentage points, five or six percentage points. Scott Walker won the recall by, by, by about seven percentage points. That's pretty convincing. That pretty uh, uh, you think this could be a six-point win for Mitt Romney? I think it could. Wow, you heard it here first. Wow. Senator Ron Not Johnson predicting Senator it could. No, no, it no, could. no it we could. wrote it down already. It's too late. We can't take it back. We can't take it back. Did, you, did you get to sign our iPad? I have not yet. All right, we'll, All right, get, we'll, we'll get you, we'll on, get the you on the way out. We'll make sure, out. You we'll can make sure that, you, that you sign Absolutely in. Absolutely, we'll do it. All right, Senator Ron Johnson, thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Enjoy, thanks, the, thanks for coming enjoy the speech. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much. On the floor right now is uh, Kerry Healy, uh, who is the former lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, tapped by Mitt Romney. Take a, take a listen to a, a little bit of what she has to tell us tonight as the, uh, the last running mate that Mitt Romney got to choose. Governor Romney did what many thought was impossible. 
He turned around a $3 billion budget gap and created a $2 billion rainy day fund. He even worked to streamline government, but at the same time made certain to safeguard protections for the elderly, children, and the homeless. In education, Governor Romney gave parents more choices, insisted on tough standards for both teachers and students, and Massachusetts schools became the best in the nation. We cleared out regulations on small businesses, and we cut taxes 19 times. And as a result, unemployment dropped to only 4.7%. And unlike President Obama, Governor Romney's economic policies were rewarded with a credit upgrade. Now those are the facts and figures, but when people find out that I served as Mitt Romney's lieutenant governor, they always ask me the same question. What's he like? First and foremost, Mitt Romney is a good and honorable man, committed to public service and his country. On the morning he took the oath of office, his first act was to focus public attention on those in need. We served breakfast to homeless veterans, encouraging volunteerism and acknowledging the special debt we owe to those who sacrifice for our country. You know, you may not know this, but Mitt Romney never took a salary as governor. But he worked harder than anyone I know. Every morning, very early before the rest of us arrived, Mitt would meet with his economic secretary. They worked tirelessly because for Mitt, creating jobs was his top priority. Mitt was always a hands-on leader. When one of Boston's tunnels collapsed, tragically killing a passenger in her car, Mitt didn't blame others. He dove in and fixed the problem. <laughs> Mitt immersed himself in the engineering challenges, personally oversaw safety inspections, abolished cronyism and corruption, and restored public confidence. That's the Mitt Romney I know, and he is ready to bring that same work ethic, vision, and integrity to the White House. <laughs> Mitt Romney will never let our children's education be second best or allow their future prosperity to be mortgaged by today's political cowardice. He will respect those who build things with their own minds and their own hands. And Mitt Romney won't just talk about family values, he will live them every day. And I'll tell you another thing. Mitt Romney understands that the world is safer when our country leads, and he will never apologize for America. <laughs> Mitt Romney will lead us back to an America we can be proud of and ahead to a future where the American dream is alive again and within every man and woman's reach. Thank you, Mitt Romney, for believing in America. And America, you can believe in Mitt Romney. Thank you. Dreams are essentially... That was Carrie Healy, the former lieutenant governor of Massachusetts. You know, Didn't they, you cover her when I, you I were did. in Boston? I did. And, and you know, Mitt Romney's relationship with her was so strong that in the first radio interview that he gave after naming her, he says he couldn't, help, he couldn't wait to start working with Sherry. 
<laughs> Carrie Healy, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> since, since became a very effective lieutenant governor, she ran for governor against the Val Patrick herself, and uh, and wound up losing uh, uh, pretty pretty dramatically, as as I recall. All right. Well, joining us here is is one of our favorites of of the. Uh, hi, she's she is uh, currently getting herself organized, only as Donna Brazil can. <laughs> it's our mystery guest. This this is Forget a, this is this is like the best swag a Democrat could ever. <laughs> possess. So what do you do with this when it's when it's done? Um, do you put a voodoo stick in it or something? No, no, no. I just cleaned up my basement and I, I added to my collection of all the other credentials yep. I have collected since 1984 attending of course Democratic Party conventions and of course this is my third Republican convention and it's been a remarkable week uh, to meet delegates from all across the country to pray with the delegates from Louisiana where I'm from about the you know the terrible storm that yeah. hit our state yep. and also to meet the Texan delegation you know I mean I just love the fact that they know how to come to a party dressed alike <laughs> yeah how about that with those hats out there yeah well, I tried on one of the shirts. hats I tried on one of the hats mm. the problem is it made my my head look too big and I, I just <laughs> put it aside we can't let that happen okay so you've been watching what's going on here very carefully as you know we'll all be heading to Charlotte in, the, in a couple of days and you're gonna have your own chance to, to rebut everything you've heard here what have you heard here that changed is the game plan? Is there anything that you have seen or heard that you said, wow, I hope the Obama team's taking notes and they respond to this next week? Well, you know, this is this is like a pep rally, a pep rally for Mitt Romney. Um, yeah, and also an audition for 2016, I have to add that. Yeah, some of that, that's I, right. I, I've met a lot of so-called potential uh, bench warmers for 2016. But it's been a pep rally for Mitt Romney. Look, he's run before uh, this, the, this fight, this nomination fight, you know, it was it was quite volatile. It was uh, unpredictable at times. Uh, I'll never forget, you know, rooting for Michelle Bachman at, at, at times. Uh, Rick Perry, oops. Uh, New Gendrich. And so, you know, this is a culmination of that period. Tonight he'll accept the, you know, the, the gavel. He is now the, the head of the Republican Party. And, and he will make his case to the American people. Um, uh, you know, in terms of what a Romney presidency will look like. So I'm, I'm, I'm here to listen. I'm not, I'm not here to rebut all of the charges, although last night it was very difficult to you just found sit a down. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure, yes. And the Referring Democrats, to the Paul Ryan speech. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 We got a lot of those, those emails uh, last night as well. All right. So, Donna, you're going to put your, I'm, I am going to make you put your Democratic strategist hat on for a minute. Right. Not, well, the, a not the cowboy hat, hat but one right, that makes right. you look good. Okay. So thus far, Democrats have spent hundred million or so dollars beating the living daylights out of the Mitt Romney record driving his negatives way way up his favorables down he comes into this convention with a 40 percent favorable rating the lowest that we've ever seen yet he's still tied with the president oh look so so is this really I mean does Mitt Romney have the job to do or is it really next week that Barack Obama has a bigger job well, to well do? first of all Mitt Romney did uh, a great job himself during the primary uh, and and raising his own negatives, uh, he had one of the most negative campaigns that I've ever seen against his his Republican opponents. I mean, I'll never forget being down here in, in Florida uh, back in January, and just looking at all of the negative ads that he ran against Newt Gingrich, for example. So I think he hurt himself back during that period of time. The, the second problem is that Mitt Romney created a little bit of drama by taking the opposing positions that he's taken in his previous political life, whether in running for the United States Senate in 1994 or, of course, and, and running for governor in 2002 or running for president. So I think President Obama's challenge next week is to tell the country where he intends to take us over the next four years. Do we go back? And, and, and of course, I know Jeb said get over it, but it's very difficult to get over it until we get through the worst economic recession uh, of, since the Great, Repress, uh, Great uh, Depression. But President Obama's challenge is to make the case of why he should be rehired. And I think President Obama has a very compelling case, and he'll make that next week in, in Charlotte. But tonight is Mitt Romney's night. This is his moment. This is his moment to, to, to demonstrate, as Ann Romney uh, told us just two nights ago, that he can dance, uh, that he can lift us up. Uh, that he has the policies that will actually bring this country uh, back on the, the path to share prosperity for all. 
I want to ask you about one speaker we heard from earlier in the week, Con uh, former Congressman Archer Davis. Yes. He came up there. He, of course, he, he was very prominent at the Democratic Convention four years ago, African-American, former congressman. He lost a primary race for governor and has now left the party. He gave a kind of an impassioned speech about why he felt sort of duped by Barack Obama. Now, Democrats have spent a lot of time making this about Arthur Davis and Arthur Davis alone, and I don't think there's going to be an African-American rebellion against Barack Obama, but is there something there to be worried about? The feeling spoken to by Paul Ryan about the fading Obama posters on the wall, the feeling that they, they feel just it just hasn't worked out like they wanted it to. You know, from the day President Obama put his hand on that Bible, uh, you know, up until this moment, all I've heard from Republicans and those who recently converted as well is that he's he's failed us. Well, Mitch McConnell said that that is what we want to do. We want to make sure that he fails. Um, for many of us, we see we see a different president. We see a man of integrity, a man of great judgment, a man who has helped restore America, America's role in the world, a man that has kept many of his campaign promises, a man who has rolled up his sleeves every day to to try to get the American people back to work. So the 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 man that the Republicans, uh, you know, have have built this caricature. He, that's not the man we know. That's not the president we respect, and that's not the leader that we see every day in our lives. All right, Donna, we have an iPad right in front of us. We're asking all of our guests to sign in, doodle something, give us a little memento of your of your glorious time in the booth, if you may, or what it meant for you here at your. My inaugural. Your, your, it's my, not your inaugural. Well, it's your inaugural time here. It's not your inaugural Republican. No, my, but my, my inaugural time in the booth here at oh, this moment. That's right. Yes, well, at this moment in we time. We want you to mark some history right there. You can draw an elephant or a donkey. It's your Well, call. no, I'm not a, a great artist, but what I will will put together is it's just um, a nice little slogan for you all uh, to remember this moment by. Wow. I, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared as well. well about that. It's always a pleasure right. to see you too. Thank you so much. Donna Brazil. And by Donna. the way, I just want to let you know on my new TV, I got a new cable system. Yeah. I can actually see you at home. We love it. You know, That's I, fantastic. Am, I am so up on the 2012 gadgetry <laughs> that you all look better in person, but you, you look good on you're my also, You're also, you're a good Twitterer too, Donna. I'm a Twitter. I got, you're, I got you're pretty good. Issue. I have an issue. Why? What's your issue? Um, I typically go to bed at night with my iPad. Uh, in your bed? Just you're holding it? Well, you know, it, it takes up a lot of space, right? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I love Twitter. I, I think of all of the wonderful tools that Al Gore invented when he created the internet, <laughs> this is one that I like the most. Well, I'm glad. And they can follow you, of well, course. You, well, you, I need you to weigh on this. We're trying to get Sam Donaldson to, to join Twitter. What do you think? Uh, I gave him a big hug today, and I think that might be just a, you know, the sweet kiss that he needs to get <laughs> on Twitter. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you both. All right. All right. Thanks. Donna Brazil. All right. So, yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be turning to the Obama message. Right. But Soon I, enough. But tonight is... It's tonight. Certainly, it is about Mitt Romney. Yep. And we've seen this Massachusetts portrait filled out a little bit. His time as, as governor. Uh, and I think it's, it's important to remember remember that the, the Romney story has not been propagated by Mitt Romney to date. And anything we see in the polling, you realize they haven't had an opportunity to do that. And look, I talked to a lot of Republicans who are frustrated by this. They say, you know, they spent way too much time this summer ceding that ground to Democrats. They let Democrats build that, build that case. And, you know, I, they wanted to, to, to see much more of a pushback by Romney about who he is and what he stands for. I think this is where uh, we may see that, you know, in the and this in the speech, and we're going to have to so we, watch someone now. Sorry, I'm just watching the dancing. We do, do want to show you. We, we we found the clip earlier because we're getting a lot of messages about what was going on with the poking. We we did, we did find it. Do you want to? We take a look and, and show you exactly what happened. We're here in the booth with uh, with Jason Jones from Comedy Central, uh, having a, having a nice discussion. And uh, this this convention became interact very interactive. If we have the video, I'd love to I'd love to see it. Yeah, um, I don't they, know. You were uh, actually getting poked by wow. a delegate. Wow, someone's that poking is, me. That is something got, new. I, know, I just got. Sorry. What's that? What? It is. It's, it is. It is uh, a convention. Is. You're right. He's talking about the death of his son, and you're laughing. I, I wasn't even listening. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, so that was a little bit. It's a little bit dangerous, and I'm sorry to say, uh, Travis. Kalanick. Is it the high pronouns you release? Uh, Travis Kalanick. Kalanick. Yeah, yeah. Of course. The man who's going to get the us The man who's going to get us. Exactly. We're getting you home and, I, and I'm hoping you're not going to get poked. Because <laughs> this is the guy with Uber. And for anybody who has not tried 
Uber, it's, I mean, Uber cab and Uber. Well, it's, it's just it's Uber. Just Uber. It's right. just Uber. It's not in all cities yet. It's slowly spreading. Well, we're in 17 cities around the world. Okay. Uh, I think that's 14, 13 in the United States. Um, we're just about to roll out Denver. We're getting ready to roll out Dallas as well. Um, and there's a whole bunch more coming. All right. So this is obviously the first time you've done a political convention. That is tell for us, sure. Can you give us some statistics? How many people you've driven well, home? Can, let's back oh, up wait. and tell people what, oh, what it does, is. You're just, right. just in yeah. case. Yeah. So, right. so basically, it's it's a, it's a, it's a, an app where right. you can get a ride. Well, the, the way I describe it is, uh, it's our motto: we're everyone's private driver, right? And what that means is, yeah, it starts with an app. You push a button, and in five minutes, a town car rolls up to take you wherever you want to go. Mm. Um, so you see the car coming to you on that on the map, right? And uh, you have credit card on file, so you, you, you're alerted when the car comes. Doors open for you. You get in the car. You go to your destination. You just get out. No cash changes hands. You rate the driver at the end of it. It's how we keep quality up. And uh, it's kind of feels like you're living in the future when you use it. All right. So now that we explained what it is, yeah. I'd love for you to give us some statistics about how many people you ferried around, how many cars you yeah. had here. What, what was so let's like? see. How can we do it? I, you know, as a private company, we try not to do stats okay. that reverse into, number, into our revenues. But here's the bottom line. Um, let's see. Hundreds of thousands of hours are driven by drivers who connect to our system. Um, so I think we're getting in. I think we may even be in the tens of thousands of drivers at this point. And we're growing 26% month over month for the last 12 months. That's 16 times bigger today than we were 12 months ago. Um, and in a whole bunch of cities, uh, we are quickly becoming uh, either the number two or number three uh, size player in getting folks moved around that city. And we don't own the we don't own the cars. Right. We do not employ drivers. What we do is we partner with small limo companies in every city, and that helps them fill their dead time. Right. So they maybe have two hours blocked in the morning, two hours maybe late afternoon, but there's huge swaths of time where they're getting nothing. And so we help them fill that time um, and basically make ends meet and ultimately invest in their business. So we have a bunch of drivers who started with us with one car, now who have 10 or 15 cars making over 100 grand each per year. And that's their American dream. So you brought it to the conventions. You, 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 you went to Charlotte and uh, you're in Tampa this yeah. week. What's it been like? Well, so we're going to Charlotte next week. Right. Tampa this week, it's, uh, it's been intense. I mean, the RNC reached out to us and said, hey, we'd love to have a, a classy, convenient ride for the folks who come here. And we said, let's do it. Um, and that meant partnering with tons of limo companies very quickly. We call it a pop-up. Uh, there's some interesting regulatory here in Tampa. The, uh, they required that the minimum fare for a ride was 15 times bigger than the minimum fare for a taxi. So if you want to go two miles down the road, the regulations say it has to be at least $50, which is not ideal. But uh, there's a lot of folks here that are on other, you know, on expense accounts. Other people are paying for their rides. So uh, we're still seeing a pretty, pretty heavy amount of activity. Well, uh, uh, and we, of course, are from D.C., and I know that sure. that's been another place where there yeah. have been some, some regulatory issues. Tell us a little bit about that, because obviously yeah. there are a lot of places where cab drivers are saying, hey, this really isn't fair. These guys yeah. get to come in, take our fare. They don't yeah. have to follow the same rules and regulations that we do. Well, you know, the, there's a fundamental difference between a taxi and a town car, right? A taxi can pick anybody up who waves them down. That's an anonymous person getting into an, ano an anonymous car. There's regulations around that to make sure you know what you're getting when you get in there on both sides. Um, we're, we're not doing anything different with town cars than what they've done before. We're just making it much more efficient. And so, and, and the thing is, the taxi drivers aren't the folks who have a diff have difficulty with us. The, you know, the thousands of drivers who are connected to our system, they are former taxi drivers. Right. They are making a lot better living working on our system than they were as a taxi driver. And it's an right. alternative. It's a better way to make a living. Tra Travis Kalanick. Of Uber, of, of Uber, Uber fame. Thank you for being yeah. here. Did you sign in on the iPad? I think I did. I said at Uber at the RNC. Oh, here. see, so, there we go. Uh, here I we can go. Show it to the there thing. we go. I'm not. I don't have good handwriting because I, I type does. these days. Nobody has good handwriting. This right, is brilliant, though. Thanks right. a lot for coming by. Thank you. Awesome. That's right, and we'll see you in Charlotte as well. Yeah, right? we'll be in Charlotte. Okay. Yep. Thanks a lot. All right. Um, all right, so we heard a little bit. Getting around the city is not an easy thing, yeah. as you know, Amy. It's actually it's something that takes away from these conventions. It feels like to me every year uh, it's, it's a little bit worse. Getting just, around, yeah. No, I, I think I, I have a new rule now. Everybody says to me, well, how, how's your hotel? Are you far away? How difficult is it? 
It's really not about how far you are. It really is. If you're not in walking distance, it's too far. That's exactly that's right. Been my, that's been my rule of thumb right there. So. All right, joining us now, Leon Cruz. How are you, sir? How are you? Nice to see you, Amy. Good to see you again. Just fine. Okay, so last night we had Paul Ryan. Tonight, of course, Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about, as you're going on, introducing him to the Univision voters. Of course, we didn't tell everybody he's here with our partner in Univision. Um, what do you think they're looking for? What are your Univision viewers looking for in Mitt Romney tonight? Well, uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I, would, I would love to, to start talking about Marco Rubio because he's going to be introducing Romney. That's right. No? He's obviously a very relevant Hispanic politician. Yes. But it's, it remains to be seen how Rubio would play in the Southwest. It's different, this part of the country, than that part of the country. So this, this speech is very important for his political life, although I do think that's a bit overrated. I was uh, running through some history of the conventions and you probably agree with me that this idea that speeches either make or break careers is not actually true. I mean, in the case of Barack Obama it happened, but Bill Clinton was uh, uh, universally, universally panned in 88 right, and four years later, no? Right. So uh, it's important for Rubio as, uh, uh, as a Hispanic politician important moment for him but uh, it remains to be seen what happens in the future and for Romney to answer your question uh, I think that uh, uh, Hispanics probably would like him to address what he said during the primaries I come back to that because that's very important he was really aggressive really extreme in his views during the primaries and now he just wants to erase them and that's not possible because uh, what happened happened no so uh, let's see if he addresses Hispanics and how he does it uh, I doubt he will uh, 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 address those issues, though. No, give, give me a sense of Marco Rubio's appeal. Is it is it far larger than the Cuban American community? When you talk about who thinks Marco Rubio is a superstar, the future of the party is he is he popular in the broader Latino community? To be very honest with you, I don't think so. I think that Rubio is uh, a, a very appealing politician, but as I told Amy, I, I, it remains to be seen how uh, he would be received in that part of the country. That might be one of the reasons why he wasn't chosen as uh, as a vice presidential candidate I think because uh, uh, it's it's very different Th there's this idea of the Hispanic vote being right. monolithic it's not it's re really not no so I don't know uh, well that that brings up a really good point because we've been hearing a lot about the Latino vote the Latino vote the Latino vote and we talk about it as monolithic but tell me what do you think it means as you move from east to west in the midwest yeah. about the kind of voter we're talking about what is the difference between western and midwestern and well, I, I would just interrupt one, to for one moment there's a lot of chanting going behind us because there's a number of olympians including Mike ruzioni of the miracle on ice team who's oh, speaking yeah. right now so there's a, a lot of usa usa chanting going on right now if we can take a moment of Mike ruzioni i think it, it, it may be worthwhile just to hear what he has to say talk with you about the global significance of the Olympic, Olympic movement, its ideals, and its meaning, and how it was rescued by Mitt Romney. <laughs> it has been over 10 years, so many of you may have forgotten. But in 2002, due to bribery scandals and mismanagement, the Olympics, not just those games, but the Olympics as an institution were threatened. Thankfully, Mitt Romney was there to salvage a desperate situation. Mitt's leadership not only turned around those games by solving the operational and financial problems, but he did something deeper. He drew a line in the sand and said that the 2002 games would have the highest standards of ethics and integrity. He put Olympians, the athletes, in the ideals of the Olympics back at the center of the games. He focused on restoring the Olympics to the top pedestal of sports, and he preserved the opportunity and idealism of the Olympics for future generations. I was fortunate to compete in the Olympics as captain of the 1980 U.S. Miracle on Ice hockey team. Thank you. And that team, and that team was proud and honored to light the cauldron for the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. That action of passing along the flame of the Olympic spirit symbolizes something grander than all of us. It is the single greatest movement that brings all humans across the world together. 
We are all fortunate that Mitt Romney kept that fire burning. As a result of the 2002 Olympics, I had the opportunity to get to know Mitt and Ann Romney and to see what they have accomplished. Mitt is a brilliant leader who was committed to the highest ideals, and he's a wonderful and caring family man. Just like the Olympics needed Mitt's leadership 10 years ago, America desperately needs Mitt Romney's leadership today. Please join me in making him the next President of the United States. Thank you. All right, and we know that this is part of the Mitt Romney story that he wants to tell of a man who turned what was a, uh, a, 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 an Olympics that was in turmoil into a big, big success. And there, are, here's one of the, uh, right behind us, of course, is one of those stars from the 2002 Winter Olympics uh, from Salt Lake City. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, I don't know what, what more we're going to hear from these guys in a little bit, but I want to move back to Leon here uh, and talk about, we were, we were talking before we moved back here about the fact that we hear so much about, about this Latino vote. vote. Yeah. It's, oh, it's one monolithic vote. Very different. Tell me what the differences are in your mind between those in different parts of the country. It's as different as it is different to be born in Cuba than to be born in Mexico. It's completely different. Uh, uh, as uh, you move west, immigration is a much more important issue because it's much more personal for voters, uh, obviously. I mean, it's not the same. The, the immigration issue is not the same for Puerto Ricans in New York or to Cuban Americans in Miami than it is to Salvadorians or Mexicans, Mexican Americans in, uh, in the western part of the country. And uh, uh, obviously that part of the country I think is going to be even more important in this election because swing states over there are, uh, uh, are, are a lot, no? And, and Florida is still up for grabs, but uh, Colorado, Nevada uh, are up for grabs and the Mexican-American vote, that part of the Hispanic vote is uh, particularly important and in that part of the country is where uh, Mitt Romney's uh, prim uh, uh, primary positions or positions during the primaries were particularly hurtful in my opinion and how I've been uh, dealing with uh, uh, the audience over there in uh, California and the southern, southwestern part of the of the of the country so it's going to be interesting how his speech is received over there all right Leon Croaz appreciate you being with us it's uh, a big pleasure here, here, here in the box we'll be checking in with you throughout appreciate it for thank, you. thank you thank over you, at see you again. an exciting new partnership that we're that we're uh, starting over here at ABC News uh, all right what's I, was, I was I was kind of hoping that the Olympians would come out wearing their Olympic gear you think you think that'd be something I think you know, that'd be something different that'd be a little surprise for us Amy I was I was reminded today of uh, the first the first time that I as a just as a news consumer ever saw Mitt Romney speak it was in the 2002 Winter Games it was the first time that most Americans probably saw Mitt Romney now whether they realized it was Mitt Romney or not maybe they had remembered his dad and uh, maybe they would remembered his Senate race but the, he was the minor figure at the time but he really he, he came into big national prominence at the time a lot of national media exposure speaking at those opening ceremonies huge scandals around those games and uh, that became the, the the central tale that uh, he built his gubernatorial campaign around that's right that's right and of course that that gubernatorial campaign that you covered really built on a lot of the themes that he's trying to to promote here in this campaign which is his success at business and his success as a turnaround artist so um but uh, we're going to talk about somebody else at this moment. We're not only talking to Olivier Knox here from Yahoo News, but he is the White House correspondent for Yahoo. And uh, so his job, of course, is to follow the guy who's sitting in the White House right now. Right. And that is President Obama. So they're trying to, 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 to bracket this, this convention. They've sent people here to come and tell us all the bad things that Republicans are saying and doing. Do you think it's been successful? Do you, would you look back and say, boy, that was a really smart use of their resources and time? Well, in, in some cases, you know, it's really easy. It's, a, it's an email that disputes some of the claims being made on the stage. That's no cost. That's no cost. But they sent people out here. They a did lot send of some people, people down here. They did some press conferences. They yeah. had their own media war room down here. You know, you, you see in some of the news stories, you see their point of view fairly well represented. You know, the, the danger is always that the convention will drown out the other side just because everyone's here, everyone's focused on this message. Um, it's it's been fine, I think. Um, you you can see uh, they were certainly happy with the results of the coverage of, of Paul Ryan's um, speech, um, but it it will will know a little bit more 
a couple of days after the convention, after the first polls come back, you know, we'll know a little bit more about how effective the convention was. And from there, we can probably deduce a little bit about how effective the, the Obama approach was. Olivia, tell me a little bit about how they have viewed this convention. Do you get a sense that they are watching it and, and, and engineering aspects of their convention in direct response? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of this stuff that's happening here, they anticipated. So um, maybe not a direct response, maybe not a last minute direct response. Um, you know, they knew that, that, that there would be a humanizing uh, effect, as there was this evening. They knew that he would defend his record at, at Bain Capital. And all these things, you know, you know are going to come up next week. That's pretty clear. Uh, but they are watching every day, and they're watching very closely to see what messages seem to be getting the most traction. Uh, and they've told us fairly bluntly that, that they're, they're going to counter those, some of those messages in, in Charlotte next week. All right, so this is supposed to be the, the most high-tech election of our time, right? right? We have all this interactive gear. Uh, but you've been taking a gander around this convention and finding that maybe it's just not so high-tech after all. Well, the really striking... Uh, aspect of that is uh, the president's schedule. You know, he's kicking off some campaign travel starting on Saturday. He's going to Iowa. He's going to go to Ohio. He's going to do a, a long blitz through the convention. And then after the convention, he has that beloved campaign uh, tool, the bus tour through Florida. It's very interesting to see that this extremely high-tech campaign is, is still uh, using the trappings of campaigns from 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And the argument basically boils down to the idea that the most important endorsement in this campaign comes from your neighbor. It comes from your relative. It comes from that guy down the bar. Uh, it comes from first-person testimonials from the people that you know and that you see every day. And that's why the president, who has this incredibly, incredibly sophisticated machine, is stopping in bakeries and bars and cafes and diners. And they are very, very open about saying that, especially in places like Iowa, voters are very receptive to that kind of retail politicking. Tell us how soon the, 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 this campaign swing is going to begin now. They're going to be building up to a week from tonight That's in the right. open air, weather permitting, in, in <laughs> Charlotte. What is, uh, what's the next six or seven days going to look like from the Obama's perspective? So President Obama and Vice President Biden were out of sight today, very conspicuously out of sight, you could say, given all of this bracketing efforts. They actually just had a, they, they sat down for their intelligence briefing. They had lunch together. That was it. Uh, tomorrow, the vice president's going uh, to, to uh, I think it's Ohio, to give a speech. Uh, the, the president himself is going to Texas on an official trip, but the campaigning starts Saturday. And from Saturday through to one week from tonight, uh, the president's going to be on the road. He's going to be pushing his message. He's going to be to try to pick up, pick up right where these guys left off and try to counter their message. So, um, Olivia, we've been asking a lot of people about, you know, what, what Mitt Romney needs to do tonight, but it seems as if it's President Obama who has just as difficult of a speech to give next week. Uh, it's obviously going to look a lot different than it did in 2008, but, but again, he's, he's tied now, today, with the guy who's going up on stage, even after spending hundreds of millions of dollars defining and, and attacking Mitt Romney. So what are the gaps that Obama, you think, needs to fill in? He needs to have a, a plausible explanation for the economy in the last three and a half years. That's the number one thing he has to do. Uh, one thing I would say about the, the, all the money that's being spent and all the effort that they've, that they've put into the campaign so far is don't forget early voting. Uh, they want to convince yep. people who are doing uh, early voting, absentee voting, that, that kind of stuff. So it's not purely about from here on out. It's also, it's also one, they wanted to lock in some of these voters, convince them, try to get them to uh, away from, uh, from Mitt Romney. So it's, it's not just about what's happening from here on out. Uh, it's absolutely the case, and you heard speaker after speaker here attack the president on the economy. Right. It's obviously his biggest vulnerability. Uh, he's found sort of a narrative that he can tell, you know, Mitt Romney's the rich guy, I'm the champion of the middle class, although I'm also rich. Uh, but the, the, it's going to turn on that. You know, can voters who watch President Obama next week come away and say, you know what, okay, I'll, I'll give this guy another four years to turn this, this thing around. What did you hear in the White House uh, after Paul Ryan was selected in terms of how this changes their campaign? You know, they thought that it actually uh, just just reaffirmed and em reemphasized their campaign. They said, oh, good, well, here's a guy who wants to give tax cuts to the investor class. Here's a guy who wants to, to roll back some of the entitlement spending. They basically just said, oh, this is great. We can just double down on our strategy. They were, uh, they were, I mean, I don't know if, I don't, they said they were, I should say. They said they were perfectly happy, perfectly pleased. We'll see how that turns out, uh, especially as polls tighten in Wisconsin and and other places. Any sense that they're ready to, to jump into Wisconsin or worried about Wisconsin as a result of the Ryan pick? Well, they've played it down so far, but I'm sure they're watching it day to day. 
Uh, you know, one of the classic reportorial problems is you can't really say they believe X or they think Y. You've got to say they, they say that they believe it. <laughs> and they, they're putting on a pretty good show of saying, nah, Wisconsin, we're not going to go up there just yet. We're not. But uh, I can guarantee you they're looking at this stuff day by day by day, even more obsessively than we are. No, that can't be possible. It, I totally promise. More, more I promise. obsessively than we are. Well, we're getting very close right now to the, to the 10 o'clock hour when our mystery guest is going to come out. Um, Olivier. Any guesses? You are, you, yeah. yeah but it is not official yet, so we can still have some fun with it. Hasn't been confirmed yet. Not right. officially official. Right. Well, obviously, you've probably talked about already uh, who it's supposed to be, who yes. were news reports. But, but so, t so tell us your favorite Clint Eastwood movie. Uh, you know, i got to go with Unforgiven. I mean, I realize, I realize it's not a classic, uh, it's not a classic Eastwood, it's not a Make My Day Eastwood, but it's, uh, it's, it's got to be my favorite. Amy, have you named yours yet? No, because I don't know any Clint Eastwood movies. So it's not my, you know what, question. I am, but you know what, Clint Eastwood is not really my demo. You know, in the spy movie... I think it's very much a, a very different demographic. In the spy movie, this is how the American counterintelligence officials figure out that you're a mole, because you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, who... This person you call Clint Eastwood. What is what is this person? Exactly. Uh, well, Olivier, let's the, the, the Romney biography briefly. We know that we know how Obama wants to tell it. We know. Are they concerned that they they thrown everything into this strategy? They, there really doesn't seem like there's a plan B. Is there a plan B? If Bain is a positive, if they if 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 Mitt Romney can turn this around and make his business experience into a positive, what are they going to talk about? Well, that's a great that's a great question, and I think they don't think they say that they don't think that uh, that that uh, this is going to be locked in one way or another. They think there are still people who can be persuaded that Bain uh, was a locust capitalist enterprise. They say they think that that this is fertile ground for them. They they're pointing to demographics in some of the battleground states, some of the working class voters there, uh, and they 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 say that this is a, an effective strategy. And I would say that while we always knew that Mitt Romney was going to run on the Bain experience, it was telling how much of that happened tonight and how much they emphasized it. Well, and should he not have been telling that story long before tonight? I mean, it's striking that basically the Obama campaign is going to be recycling attacks we heard from Newt Gingrich right. during the Republican primaries. Right. And they, they didn't seem all that sure-footed back then. They basically tried to cast it as an attack on all free enterprise. Uh, but yeah, they, 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 it's interesting. I was really struck by the, the family's testimonials. These are, these are incredibly affecting yep. stories. And I was sort of surprised that they're, they're rolling them out now. I mean, there was a, there was a, a figure this morning that this, the, the viewership for last night was half of what it was four years ago on the same night. Oh, the jarring. You have to wonder how that's going to play. Are they going to have regrets that they didn't start playing right, this up? Right. Olivia right. Knox from Yahoo News. We appreciate it. We're going to take you now to the floor where a campaign video has been put together by the Romneys. Take a look. Opportunity and hope and give everyone a fair chance, you're going to see this country come roaring back. predict what kind of tough decisions are going to come in front of a president's desk. And if you really want to know how a person will operate, look at how they've lived their life. They were asking me about what's going on with, you know, with, with what happened with the scandal and, and, uh, and what my opinion is of if we can pull this thing off. And I said, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be just fine. And he said, how do you know? And I said, because I just met Mitt Romney. People were afraid. People were thinking that something terrible could happen. After 9-11, the way we looked at these events changed drastically. More so than any Olympic Games, the world was really watching this one. How was the United States going to respond? Could they put on an Olympic Games? It was worse than I'd expected. I thought the Salt Lake turnaround was just a public relations turnaround. Instead, it turned out to be a financial turnaround and a governmental turnaround. He was not a figurehead. He was not only running this show, but he was out there speaking to the people and showing them through his words, through his actions, what the Olympics could mean to the United States. When I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, both of us just dissolved in tears. Probably the toughest time of my life. 
was, uh, was standing there with Ann um, as we hugged each other and the diagnosis came. I was very, very ill. I don't know if people knew how sick I was. I was frightened, Mitt was frightened, but I needed him desperately. Look, I'm happy in life as long as I've got uh, my soulmate with me. Mitt decided that he was going to honor heroes throughout the country and that the torch relay was going to be all about heroes. And Mitt chose me as his hero. My life was in, you know, in jeopardy. And I was like as vulnerable as a person could be. And I trust Mitt. I trust him with my life. Uh, she's gorgeous, uh, absolutely beautiful. You know, I can't explain love. I, I, I don't know why it happens. I don't know why it endures the way it does. Uh, you know, at the very beginning, I sat with her, chatted with her, put my arm around her, and you know, something changed. My 16th birthday party was when Mitt and I really became sort of an item. Mitt helped plan it, and it was, it was just a, sort of the beginning of our romance. 1968, he flew into the Detroit airport right before Christmas. Of course, his mother has like got her arms open and he runs right by her <laughs> and grabs me. On the car ride home from the airport, I turned to Ann and said, I feel like I've never been away. And she said, I feel the same way. So by the time we got home, we got out of the car and we tell everybody, well, we're getting married like next week. <laughs> We compromised and waited until March 21st. You sweet baby. You sweet baby. I could do okay when I hit the two. My brother and I, Matt, fought a lot. Three, not bad. Four, it got, it got to be a little much. Hello, Ben! Oh my gosh. Very rambunctious. Guys, I do not want to put in the water on the mud. Oh, here I am. And then with the fifth one, and Craig was my most active child. He was a handful. Craigie, hi. Oh, Craig, don't squirt me. I remember my mom was always begging for us to be quiet. Just please, can I have quiet in this house? We could bend a lot of rules and get into a lot of trouble. We could never, ever say anything bad about my mom. I traveled a good deal in my early career. I would call Ann and I could hear the boys in the background and she might be a little exasperated. And I said, Ann, don't forget, what you're doing is more important than what I'm doing. I hate to say it, but often I had more than five sons. I had six sons. How you doing, Knuckle Snorts? He was really playful. You know, you know, it's like, you know, you know. Mitt would walk in the door after work, leave the briefcase at the door. That was it. Never thought about work again until he left in the morning. We just felt like we were the most important thing in his life. I went to mom if I ever needed money, because he never went to dad. <laughs> it was way too cheap. My dad didn't have the right bulb, so he replaced it just with whatever bulb he had. The problem is it sticks out way too far and blinds you as you cook. So he just solved that with some tin foil and duct tape. I've been poor. I've worked from the time I was 12. I know what poverty is. I've been up through it. For Mitt, I think he idealized his father. He really was his hero. In the summer, my dad used to pack up our family and take us to the great national parks. It was during those trips that I fell in love with America. Dad was born in Mexico. His parents and grandparents had moved to Mexico. They were refugees from a revolution. I remember Ann asking my dad, what was the most meaningful accomplishment of your life? And without hesitation, he said, the greatest accomplishment in my life is having raised you four kids. Like me, he fell in love young. Family for my mom and dad was everything. My dad worked for his dad. He was a drywall guy. Back then, they called it lath and plaster. He could put nails in his mouth and spit them out pointy and forward. I grew up watching my dad lead. Look, I'm in public life today because I'm concerned about America. I'm concerned about what's happening to America. If he felt some way about a particular issue, there was no question in your mind about how he felt. Friends called him the brick because he was immovable. He let me tag along in some very unusual settings. What's the best car on the road? <laughs> Rambler. <laughs> I didn't realize he was giving me an experience that was more helpful from a leadership standpoint than anything I learned in school. 
Staples, I think, is a good example of where Bain and Company can support the management of an excellent company. What was special about Mitt is he understood what was behind the numbers. What's behind the numbers was great people. Mitt Romney valued every employee. He made it a point to let us know that every employee was critical to the success of Staples. Why would anybody want to save on envelopes and, and file folders? Mitt is a cheap son of a gun. And if he could save 50 cents on paper clips, he'd drive a mile to do it. Mitt knows how to grow jobs, bring jobs back to this country. And if you ask me why, because I've seen him do it firsthand. He was dealing with the fundamental problems that companies confront. He was dealing with them in a way that allowed them to grow, to add jobs, to build factories. Wicked smart. When I became governor of Massachusetts, I, uh, I took the skills I'd learned in business and went to look at our state budget. We were about $3 billion out of balance. I'll never forget the first cabinet meeting. The governor asked one of his assistants to bring out a list of campaign promises. Now, there were something like 44 campaign promises. The governor said, by the end of this administration, we're going to go right down this checklist and keep each and every promise that was made. And I said, he's different. <laughs> I actually cut spending dollars in Massachusetts, and we balanced our budget and went from a $3 billion budget gap in my first year to over $2 billion rainy day fund. When he came into office, we were in fiscal crisis. When we came out, we were on much more solid footing. His whole life has brought him to this point of being able to have the skills and the experience to be able to tackle something as difficult as this, as turning this country around. Mitt Romney is in this race, I believe, not just for himself. He's in it to improve the lives of the American people. He's an extraordinary chief executive officer. I know he understands the economy. He's uniquely qualified to get our economy moving again. Takes control. He's not a stuffed shirt guy. Charismatic. He is rock solid. An authentic leader. His values are so strong. He's a man of faith. Extraordinary character. Cares about the lives of those with voices that are unheard. An amazing, humble man. I think he has a great deal of pride and love for this country. Finds a way of turning adversity into opportunity. He knows he's one of the only guys that can do what it's going to take and turn this country around. every waking hour of my energy to getting America strong again. That's what an American president has to do. Romney, a lot of a lot of really effective, I think, home video used as part of that to show Mitt Romney the family man. You know what? Enter the prime time hour here during the Republican National Convention. And we're waiting, of course, for that mystery guest who's no longer a mystery. It's Clint Eastwood, of course. If no, somebody you else ruined the surprise. If if someone else showed up that was not Clint Eastwood, that would be a surprise. My official party line is that I'm. It's it's going to be a surprise guest. Sorry. All right. Well, one thing I want to note about that that video that we just saw is the fact that this is where you realize we've crossed a threshold into a new I generation. Yeah, I think we're seeing, right. we're seeing the moment now. Right. The mystery. The mystery guest. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Mystery solved. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Save a little for Mitt. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what's a movie tradesman doing uh, out here? You know, they're all left-wingers out there, left of Lenin. <laughs> At least that's what people think, but that's not really the case. There's a lot of conservative people, a lot of moderate people, 
Republicans, Democrats in, in uh, Hollywood. It's just that conservative people, by the nature of the word itself, are play it a little more close to the vest. And they don't go around uh, hot dog in it. So. Uh, <laughs> But, but they're there, believe me, they're there. And, uh, and I, I just, uh, I think, that in fact, there's some of them around town. I saw John Voigt, there's a lot of uh, people around here in town. John's here, Academy Award winner, uh, terrific guy. And these people are all like-minded, like all of us. Uh, so I've got, um, I've got Mr. Obama sitting here. And he's, uh, I, I just was going to ask him a couple questions. But, uh, you know, about, uh, I, I remember three and a half years ago when Mr. Obama won the election. And uh, though I wasn't a big supporter, I was watching that night when he was uh, having that thing. And they were talking about hope and change. And they were talking about, yes, we can. And, and it was dark and it was outdoors and it was nice. And people were lighting candles and they were saying, uh, uh, you, you know, and, and I just uh, thought, this is great. I mean, everybody's crying. Oprah was crying. And uh, <laughs> I was even crying. And then finally, I haven't cried that hard since I found out that uh, there's 23 million unemployed people in this country. And now that, that is something uh, to cry for because uh, that is a disgrace, a national disgrace. And we haven't done enough, obviously. Uh, this administration hasn't done enough to cure that. And uh, whatever, whatever uh, interest they have is, is not strong enough. And I think possibly now it may be time for somebody else to come along and solve the problem. So, so, Mr. President, how do you uh, how do you handle uh, how do you handle promises that you made when you were running for election, and how do you handle it, uh, how do you handle it? I mean, what do you say to people? Do you uh, do you just uh, you know? I know people uh, people were wondering. You don't. You don't have it. Okay. Well, I know even some of the people in your own party were very disappointed when you didn't close Gitmo. And I thought, uh, well, I think get closing Gitmo, why close that? We've spent so much money on it. Uh, but uh, I thought maybe it's an excuse. Uh, uh, oh, you, what do you mean, shut up? <laughs> I, okay. It just, I thought it was just because somebody had a stupid idea of trying uh, terrorists in downtown New York City. Maybe that would be. I've got, to, I've got to hand it to you. I've, I've got to give credit where credit's due. You did overrule that finally. And uh, uh, that's so, now we're moving onward. And I know in, in the, uh, I know you were against uh, the war in Iraq, and uh, that's okay. Uh, but you thought the war in Afghanistan was, was uh, okay. You know, I mean, you thought that was something that was worth doing. We didn't check with the Russians to see how they did there for the 10 years. <laughs> but, but it, uh, we, we did it, and uh, it, it was, um, it, it, you know, it, it's, uh, it's something to, uh, to be thought about. And I think that, uh, that when we get to uh, uh, maybe, uh, I think you mentioned something about having a target date for bringing everybody home. And you give that target date, and, uh, and I think uh, Mr. Romney asked the only sensible question on it. He says, why are you giving the date out now? Why don't you just bring them home tomorrow morning? And uh, I, thought, I, I thought, yeah, there's a, I, I'm not going to shut up. It's my turn. <laughs> so anyway, we got, we're going to have, uh, we're going to have to have a little chat about that. And then uh, I, I just wondered, these, all these promises, and then I, I wondered about, uh, uh, you know, when, 
want when uh, the uh, what? What do you want me to tell Romney? I can't tell him to do that. I can't do that to himself. You're, you're crazy. You're, you're absolutely crazy. That's a, you're getting as bad as Biden. I thought, of course, we all know Biden is the Biden, Biden is the intellect of the uh, Democratic Party. So we, uh, yeah, just a kind of a kind of a grin with a body behind it, you know, it's just kind of a thing. But um, uh, I, I just uh, I just think that uh, there's so much to be done, and uh, I think that Mr. Uh, Mr. Romney and and Mr. Ryan are two guys that can come along. I, see, I never thought that it was a good idea for attorneys to be president anyway, because it... <laughs> yeah, I think, I think attorneys are so busy, you know, they're always taught to argue everything and always weigh everything and weigh both sides. And, and uh, they're always, uh, you know, uh, they're always uh, devils advocating this. And, and bifurcating this and bifurcating that, you know, all that stuff. But uh, I think it's maybe time, what do you think, for maybe a uh, businessman? How about that? Yeah. A stellar businessman. Quote, unquote, a stellar businessman. And I think it's that time. And I think if you just kind of stepped aside and Mr. Romney uh, can kind of take over, uh, you could still use the plane. They, they, though, though maybe a smaller one, not that big gas guzzler that you're driving around when you're going around to colleges and uh, talking about uh, student loans and stuff like that. I think you're an ec ecological man. Why would you want to drive that truck around? Okay. Well, anyway. All right. I'm sorry. I can't do that to myself either. So, uh, anyway. I see. But I'd just like to say something, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, something uh, that I think is very important is that you, we, we own this country. We, we own it, and it's not you owning it and not politicians owning it. Politicians are employees of ours. And uh, so, they're just gonna come around and beg for votes every few years, and it's the same old deal. But I just think that uh, it's important that you realize that, that, and, and that you're the best in the world. And uh, whether you're Democrat or whether you're a pro Republican or whether you're Libertarian or whatever, you're the best and we should not ever forget that. And we, when somebody does not do the job, we've got to let them go. Okay, just remember that. And I'm speaking out for everybody out there. It, it doesn't hurt, we don't have to be. I don't say that word anymore. Well, maybe one last time. We don't have to be, what I'm saying is we don't have to be metal masochists and vote for somebody that we don't even really want in, the, in, the, uh, in office. We, just because they uh, seem to be nice guys or maybe not so nice guys if you look at some of the recent ads going out there, I don't know. But, but um, okay. You ought to make my day. Huh? All right.
I, all right. I'll start it. You finish it. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. from the great state of Florida, Senator Marco Rubio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I just drank Clint Eastwood's water. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here today, and thank you so much for doing this convention here in Florida. You know, before I begin, this is, thank you. Before I begin, this is such an important night for our country. I want to take just, with your permission, just a few seconds to talk about another country, a country located just a few hundred miles away from this city, the country of my parents' birth. There's no freedom or liberty in Cuba, and, and tonight I ask for your prayers that soon freedom and liberty will be theirs as well. It, you know, this is a big honor for me. Just a, not so long ago, I was just a deep underdog candidate. The only people that thought I could win all lived in my house. Four of them were under the age of 10. But this is incredible when I was asked to introduce Governor Romney, who we'll hear from in just a moment. I promise you he's backstage ready to go. And so I called a few people and I asked them, what should I say? And they had a lot of different opinions, but the one thing they all said is, don't mess it up. So I thought the best way to introduce Mitt Romney tonight, the next president of the United States, is to talk is to talk about what this election is about. And I'm so honored to be able to do it here in Florida at the Republican National Convention in front of all you patriots. I watched my first convention in 1980 with my grandfather. My grandfather was born to a farming family in rural Cuba. Childhood polio left him permanently disabled. Because he couldn't work the farm, his family sent him to school. He was the only one in his family that knew how to read. He was a huge influence on me growing up. As a boy, I used to sit on the porch of our house and listen to his stories about history and politics and baseball as he would puff on one of his three daily Padron cigars. Now, I, I don't remember. It's been three decades since we last sat on that porch. And I don't remember all the things he talked to me about. But the one thing I remember is the one thing he wanted me never to forget that the dreams he had when he was young became impossible to achieve. But there was no limit how far I could go because I was an American. Now for those of us, here's why I say that. Here's why I say that, because for those of us who are born and raised in this country, sometimes it becomes easy to forget how special America is. But my grandfather understood how different America was from the rest of the world because he knew life outside America. Tonight, you will hear from another man who understands what makes America exceptional. <laughs> Mitt Romney knows America's prosperity didn't happen because our government simply spent more money. It happened because our people used their own money to open a business. And when they succeed, they hire more people who invest or spend their money in the economy, helping others start a business or create jobs. Now tonight, we've heard for a long time now about Mitt Romney's success in business. It's well known. But we've also learned that he's so much more than that. Mitt Romney's a devoted husband, a father, a grandfather, a generous member of his community and church, a role model for younger Americans like myself, Everywhere he's been, 
He's volunteered his time and talent to make things better for those around him. And we are blessed that a man like this will soon be the president of these United States. Now, let me be clear so no one misunderstands. Our problem with President Obama isn't that he's a bad person. Okay? By all accounts, he too is a good husband and a good father and thanks to lots of practice, a good golfer. <laughs> Our problem is not that he's a bad person. Our problem is that he's a bad president. <laughs> you think he's watching tonight? Because his new slogan for his campaign is the word forward. Forward. A government that spends $1 trillion more than it takes in? An $800 billion stimulus that created more debt than jobs? A government intervention into health care paid for with higher taxes and cuts to Medicare? Scores of new rules and regulations? These ideas don't move us forward. These ideas move us backwards. These are tired and old big government ideas that have failed every time and everywhere they've been tried. These are ideas that people come to America to get away from. These, these are ideas that threaten to make a more America more like the rest of the world instead of helping the rest of the world become more like America. As for his old slogan, under Barack Obama, the only change is that hope is hard to find. Now, sadly, millions of Americans are insecure about their future. But instead of inspiring us, by reminding us of what makes us special. He divides us against each other. He tells Americans that they're worse off because others are better off, that rich people got rich by making other people poor. Hope and change has become divide and conquer. But in the end, this election, doesn't matter how you feel about President Obama, because this election is about your future, not about his. And, and this election is not simply a choice between a Democrat and a Republican. It's a choice about what kind of country we want America to be. And as we prepare to make this choice, we should remember what made us special. You see, for most of, our, of human history, almost everybody was poor. Power and wealth only belong to a few. Your rights were whatever your rulers allowed you to have. Your future was determined by your past. If your parents were poor, so would you be. If you were born without opportunities, so were your children. But America was founded on the principle that every person has God-given rights. Founded on the belief that power belongs to the people. That government exists to protect our rights and serve our interests. And that no one should be trapped in the circumstances of their birth. We should be free to go as far as our talents and our work can take us. And we're special. We're special because we're united mind. We're united not as a common race or a common ethnicity. We're bound together by common values. That family is the most important institution in society. And that Almighty God is the source of all we have.
We're special. We're special because we've never made the mistake of believing that we are so smart that we can rely solely on our leaders or on our government. Our national motto, in God we trust, reminding us that faith in our Creator is the most important American value of them all. And we're special. We're special because we've always understood the scriptural admonition that for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. Well, my fellow Americans, we are a uniquely blessed people. And we have honored those blessings with the enduring example of an exceptional America. I know for many of you watching at home tonight, the last few years have tested your faith in the promise of America. Maybe you're at an age when you thought you would be entering retirement, but now because your savings and investments are wiped out, your future is uncertain. Maybe after years of hard work, this was the time you expected to be your prime earning years, but instead you've been laid off and your house is worth less than your mortgage. Maybe you did everything you were told you needed to do to get ahead. You studied hard and finished school, but now you owe thousands of dollars in student loans. You can't find a job in your field, and you've had to move back in with your parents. You want to believe that we're still that special place where anything is possible. But you just don't seem, things just don't seem to be getting any better. And you wonder if things will ever be the same again. Yes, we live in a troubled time, but the story of those who came before us reminds us that America has always been about new beginnings. And Mitt Romney is running for president because he knows that if we are willing to do for our children what our parents did for us, life in America can be better than it has ever been. My mother was one of seven girls whose parents often went to bed hungry so their children wouldn't. My father lost his mother when he was nine. He had to leave school and go to work, and he would work for the next 70 years of his life. They immigrated to America with little more than the hope of a better life. My dad was a bartender. My mom was a cashier, a hotel maid, a stock clerk at Kmart. They never made it big. They were never rich. And yet they were successful because just a few decades removed from hopelessness, they made possible for us all the things that had been impossible for them. Many nights growing up, I would hear my father's keys jingling at the door as he came home after another 16-hour day. Many mornings I woke up just as my mother got home from the overnight shift at Kmart. When you're young and you're in a hurry, the meaning of moments like this escape you. But now, as my children get older, I understand it better. My dad used to tell us, "En este país ustedes van a poder lograr todas las cosas que nosotros no pudimos." In this country, in this country, you're going to be able to accomplish all the things we never could. A few years ago, during a speech, I noticed a bartender behind a portable bar in the back of the ballroom. And I remembered my father, who worked for many years as a banquet bartender. He was grateful for the work he had, but that's not the life he wanted for us. You see, he stood behind a bar in, in the back of the room all those years, so one day I could stand behind a podium in the front of a room. That journey, that journey from behind that bar to behind this podium goes to the essence of the American miracle, that we're exceptional not because we have more rich people here, we're special because dreams that are impossible anywhere else, they come true here. But.
that's not just my story. That's your story. That's our story. That's the story of your mothers who struggled to give you what they never had. That's the story of your fathers who worked two jobs so that the doors that had been closed for them would be open for you. That's the story of that teacher or that coach that taught you the lessons that made you who you are today. And it's the story of a man who was born into an uncertain future in a foreign country. His family came to America to escape revolution. They struggled through poverty and the Great Depression. And yet he rose to be an admired businessman and public servant. And in November, his son Mitt Romney will be elected president of these United States. In America, in America, we are all just a generation or two removed from someone who made our future the purpose of their lives. America is the story of everyday people who did extraordinary things, a story woven deep into the fabric of our society. Their stories may never be famous, but in the lives they live, you will find the essence of America's greatness. And to make sure that America is still a place where tomorrow is always better than yesterday, that is what our politics should be about. And that is what we are deciding this election. We decide, do we want our children to inherit our hopes and dreams? Or do we want them to inherit our problems? Because Mitt Romney believes that if we succeed in changing the direction of our country, our children and grandchildren will be the most prosperous generation ever, and their achievements will astonish the world. The story of our time will be written by Americans who haven't yet even been born. Let us make sure they write that we did our part. That in the early years of this new century, we lived in an uncertain time. But we did not allow fear to cause us to abandon what made us special. We chose more government instead of more freedom. We chose the principles of our founding to solve the challenges of our time. We chose a special man to lead us in a special time. We chose Mitt Romney to lead our nation, and because we did, the American miracle lived on for another generation to inherit. My fellow Republicans, my fellow Americans, I am proud to introduce to you the next President of the United States of America, Mitt Romney.
Mitt Romney coming out. This is this is pretty unusual, and he looks like a guy who's coming in for a State of the Union speech, right? The exact same thought, greeting dignitaries, yeah. shaking hands, That's a right. different entry than we've seen before, Amy. It is, absolutely. Normally they come out from behind the stage, in this case coming right down the center aisle. The nice thing about our view, by the way, is that we had an inkling this was happening because you could see the Secret Service starting to line that corridor, and uh, that seemed a little bit unusual for a convention. And then, of course, I noticed that the photographers were starting to line up at the bottom of the stage. So it became pretty clear about five minutes ago that Mitt Romney was going to come in and greet these people hands on. Again, a man of the people, perhaps, the goal here, as well as a presidential look. I, I think that's right. And Mitt Romney now with his big moment. That was Senator Marco Rubio introducing him. Before that, what we can only describe as a bizarre speech by Clint Eastwood working on his own. But now it is Mitt Romney's moment entering the stage and getting to the point that his father famously could never get to, walking up the stairs. That's right. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman and Delegates, Mr. Chairman and Delegates, I accept your nomination for President of the United States. I do so with humility, deeply moved by the trust you've placed in me. It's a great honor. It's an even greater responsibility. And tonight I'm asking you to join me to walk together to a better future. And by my side, I've chosen a man with a big heart from a small town. He represents the best of America. A man who will always make us very proud, my friend and America's next Vice President, Paul Ryan. In the days ahead, you're going to get to know Paul and Jana better. But last night, America got to see what I saw in Paul Ryan a strong and caring leader who's down to earth and confident in the challenge this moment demands. I love the way he lights up around his kids and how he's not embarrassed to show the world how much he loves his mom. But Paul, I still like the playlist on my iPod better than yours. Four years ago, I know that many Americans felt a fresh excitement about the possibilities of a new president. That choice was not the choice of our party, but Americans always come together after elections. We're a good and generous people, and we're united by so much more than what divides us. When that election was over, when the yard signs came down and the television commercials finally came off the air, Americans were eager to go back to work, to live our lives the way Americans always have optimistic and positive and confident in the future. That very optimism is uniquely American. It's what brought us to America. We're a nation of immigrants. We're the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the ones who wanted a better life, the driven ones, 
the ones who woke up at night hearing that voice telling them that life in the place called America could be better. They came not just in pursuit of the riches of this world, but for the richness of this life. Freedom, freedom of religion, freedom to speak their mind, freedom to build a life, and yes, freedom to build a business with their own hands. This is the essence of the American experience. We Americans have always felt a special kinship with the future. When every new wave of immigrants looked up and saw the Statue of Liberty or knelt down and kissed the shores of freedom just 90 miles from Castro's tyranny, these new Americans surely had many questions. But none doubted that here in America they could build a better life, that in America their children would be blessed more than they. But today, Four years from the excitement of that last election, for the first time, the majority of Americans now doubt that our children will have a better future. It's not what we were promised. Every family in America wanted this to be a time when they could get a little ahead, put aside a little more for college, do more for the elderly mom that's now living alone, or give a little more to their church or their charity. Every small business wanted these to be their best years ever when they could hire more do more for those who had stuck with them through the hard times, open a new store or sponsor that little league team. Every new college graduate thought they'd have a good job by now, a place of their own. They could start paying back some of their loans and build for the future. This is when our nation was supposed to start paying down the national debt and rolling back those massive deficits. This was the hope and change America voted for. It's not just what we wanted, it's not just what we expected, it's what Americans deserved. because during these years you worked harder than ever before. You deserved it because when it cost more to fill up your car, you cut out, cut out moving lights and put in longer hours. Or when you lost that job that paid $22.50 an hour with benefits, you took two jobs at nine bucks an hour. You deserve it because your family depended on you. And you did it because you're an American and you don't quit. You did it because it was what you had to do. But driving home late from that second job or standing there watching the gas pump hit $50 and still going, when the realtor told you that to sell your house you'd have to take a big loss, in those moments you knew that this just wasn't right. But what could you do except work harder, do with less, Try to stay optimistic, hug your kids a little longer. Maybe spend a little more time praying that tomorrow would be a better day. I wish President Obama had succeeded because I want America to succeed. But his promises gave way to disappointment and division. This isn't something we have to accept. Now is the moment when we can do something. And with your help, we will do something. Now is the moment when we can stand up and say, I'm an American. I make my destiny. We deserve better. My children deserve better. My family deserves better. My country deserves better.
So here we stand. Americans have a choice, a decision. To make that choice, you need to know more about me and where I'd lead our country. I was born in the middle of the century, in the middle of the country, a classic baby boomer. It was a time when Americans were returning from war and eager to work. To be an American was to assume, assume that all things were possible. When President Kennedy challenged Americans to go to the moon, the question wasn't whether we'd get there, it was only when we'd get there. The soles of Neil Armstrong's boots on the moon made permanent impressions on our souls. Anne and I watched those steps together on her parents' sofa. Like all Americans, we went to bed that night knowing we lived in the greatest country in the history of the world. God bless Neil Armstrong. Tonight, that American flag is still there on the moon. And I don't doubt for a second that Neil Armstrong's spirit is still with us. That unique blend of optimism, humility, and the utter confidence that when the world needs someone to do the really big stuff, you need an American. My dad had been born in Mexico, and his family had to leave during the Mexican Revolution. I grew up with stories of his family being fed by the U.S. government as war refugees. My dad never made it through college, and he apprenticed as a lath and plaster carpenter. He had big dreams. He convinced my mom, a beautiful young actress, to give up Hollywood to marry him. They moved to Detroit. He led a great... Uh, He led a great automobile company and became governor of the great state of Michigan. We were, we were Mormons and growing up in Michigan, that might have seemed unusual or out of place, but I really don't remember it that way. My friends cared more about what sports teams we followed than what church we went to. My mom and dad gave their kids the, the greatest gift of all, the gift of unconditional love. They cared deeply about who we would be and much less about what we would do. Unconditional love is a gift that Ann and I have tried to pass on to our sons and now to our grandchildren. All the laws and legislation in the world will never heal this world like the loving hearts and arms of mothers and fathers. You know, if every child could drift to sleep feeling wrapped in the love of their family and God's love, this world would be a far more gentle and better place. My mom and dad were married for 64 years. And if you wondered what their secret was, you could have asked the local florist. Because every day, Dad gave mom a rose, which he put on her bedside table. That's how she found out what happened on the day my father died. She went looking for him because that morning there was no rose. My mom and dad were true partners, a life lesson that shaped me by everyday example. When my mom ran for the Senate, my dad was there for her every step of the way. I can still see her saying in her beautiful voice, why should women have any less say than men about the great decisions facing our nation? Don't, don't you wish she could have been here at this convention? 
and heard leaders like Governor Mary Fallon, Governor Nikki Haley, Governor Susanna Martinez, Senator Kelly Ayotte, and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. As governor of Massachusetts, I, I chose a woman lieutenant governor, a woman chief of staff. Half of my cabinet and senior officials were women. And in business, I mentored and supported great women leaders who went on to run great companies. I grew up in Detroit in love with cars and wanted to be a car guy like my dad. But by the time I was out of school, I realized that I had to go out on my own, that if I stayed around Michigan in the same business, I'd never really know if I was getting a break because of my dad. I wanted to go someplace new and improve myself. Those weren't the easiest of days. Many long hours and weekends working, five young sons who seemed to have this need to reenact a different world war every night. <laughs> but if you ask Ann and I what we'd give to break up just one more fight between the boys or wake up in the morning and discover a pile of kids asleep in our room. Well, every mom and dad knows the answer to that. Those days were the... <laughs> the, these were tough days on Anne, particularly. She was uh, heroic through it all. Five boys with our families a long way away. I had to travel a lot for my job then, and I'd, I'd call and try to offer support. But every mom knows that doesn't help get the homework done or get the kids out the door to school. And I knew that her job as a mom was harder than mine, and I knew without question that her job as a mom was a lot more important than mine. And as America saw Tuesday night, Anne would have succeeded at anything she wanted to do. Like a lot of families in a new place with no family, we we found kinship with a wide circle of friends through our church. When we were new to the community, it was welcoming, and as the years went by, it was a joy to help others who just moved into town or just joined our church. We had remarkably vibrant and diverse congregations from all walks of life, and many who were new to America. We prayed together, our kids played together, and we always stood ready to help each other out in different ways. That's how it is in America. We look to our communities, our faiths, our families for our joy, our support in good times and bad. It's both how we live our lives and why we live our lives. The strength and power and goodness of America has always been based on the strength and power and goodness of our communities, our families, and our faiths. That's the bedrock of what makes America, America. In our best days, we can feel the vibrancy of America's communities, large and small. It's when we see that new business opening up downtown. It's when we go to work in the morning and see everybody else on the block doing the same thing. It's when our son or daughter calls from college to talk about which job they offer they should take. And you try not to choke up when you hear that the one they like best is not too far from home. It's that good feeling when you have more time to volunteer to coach your kid's soccer team or help out on school trips. But for too many Americans, those kind of good days are harder to come by. How many days have you woken up feeling that something really special was happening in America? Many of you felt that way on Election Day four years ago. Hope and change had a powerful appeal. But tonight, I'd ask a simple question. If you felt that excitement when you voted for Barack Obama, Shouldn't you feel that way now that he's President Obama? You know there's something wrong with the kind of job he's done as president 
when the best feeling you had was the day you voted for him. <laughs> the president hasn't disappointed you because he wanted to. The president has disappointed America because he hasn't led America in the right direction. He took office with a, without the basic qualification that most Americans have, and one that was essential to the task at hand. He had almost no experience working in a business. Jobs to him are about government. I learned the real lessons about how America works from experience. When I was 37, I helped start a small company. My partners and I had been working for a company that was in the business of helping other businesses. So some of us had this idea that if we really believed our advice was helping companies, we should invest in companies. We should bet on ourselves and our, on our advice. So we started a new business called Bank Capital. The only problem was, while, while we believed in ourselves, not many other people did. We were young and had never done this before, and we almost didn't get off the ground. In those days, sometimes I wondered if I'd made a really big mistake. By the way, I I'd thought about asking my church's pension fund to invest, but I didn't. <laughs> I figured it was bad enough that I might lose my investors' money, but I didn't want to go to hell, too. Shows what I know. Another of my partners got the Episcopal Church pension fund to invest. And today there are a lot of happy retired priests who should thank him. That business we started with 10 people has now grown into a great American success story. Some of the companies we helped start are names you, you know and you've heard from tonight. An office company called uh, Staples where I'm pleased to see the Obama campaign's been shopping. <laughs> the Sports Authority, which of course became a favorite of my boys. We helped start an early childhood learning company called Bright Horizons that First Lady Michelle Obama rightly praised. And at a time when nobody thought we'd ever see a new steel mill bu built in America, we took a chance and built one in a cornfield in Indiana. Today, today Today, Steel Dynamics is one of the largest steel producers in the United States. These, these are American success stories. And yet the centerpiece of the president's entire re-election campaign is attacking success. Is it any wonder that someone who attacks success has led the worst economic recovery since the Great Depression? In America, we celebrate success. We don't apologize for success. Now, now we weren't always successful at Bain. But no one ever is in the real world of business. That's what this president doesn't seem to understand. Business and growing jobs is about taking risk, sometimes failing, sometimes succeeding, but always striving. It's about dreams. Usually it doesn't work out exactly as you might have imagined. Steve Jobs was fired at Apple. And then he came back and changed the world. It's the genius of the American free enterprise system to harness the extraordinary creativity and talent and industry of the American people with a system that's dedicated to creating tomorrow's prosperity, not trying to redistribute today's.
that's why, that's why every president since the Great Depression who came before the American people asking for a second term could look back at the last four years and say with satisfaction, you're better off than you were four years ago, except Jimmy Carter, <laughs> and except this president. This president can ask us to be patient. This president can tell us it was someone else's fault. This president can tell us that the next four years he'll get it right. But this president cannot tell us that you're better off today than when he took office. America's been patient. Americans have supported this president in good faith. But today, the time has come to turn the page. Today, the time has come for us to put the disappointments of the last four years behind us, to put aside the divisiveness and the recriminations, to forget about what might have been and to look ahead to what can be. Now is a time to restore the promise of America. Many Americans have given up on this president, but they haven't ever thought about giving up. Not on themselves, not on each other, and not on America. What is needed in our country today is not complicated or profound. It doesn't take a special government commission to tell us what America needs. What America needs is jobs, lots of jobs. In the richest country in the history of the world, this Obama economy has crushed the middle class. Family income has fallen by $4,000, but health insurance premiums are higher. Food prices are higher. Utility bills are higher. And gasoline prices, they've doubled. Today, more Americans wake up in poverty than ever before. Nearly one out of six Americans is living in poverty. Look around you. These aren't strangers. These are our brothers and sisters, our fellow Americans. His policies have not helped create jobs. They've depressed them. And this I can tell you about President, where President Obama would take America. His plan to raise taxes on small business won't add jobs. It would eliminate them. His assault on coal and gas and oil will send energy and manufacturing jobs to China. His trillion dollar cuts to our military will eliminate hundreds of thousands of jobs and also put our security at greater risk. His $716 billion cut to Medicare to finance Obamacare will both hurt today's seniors and depress innovation and jobs in medicine. <laughs> and his trillion dollar deficits, they slow our economy, restrain employment, and cause wages to stall. To the majority of Americans who now believe that the future will not be better than the past, I can guarantee you this, if Barack Obama is reelected, you'll be right. I'm running for president to help create a better future. A future where everyone who wants a job can find a job. Where no senior feels for the, fears for the security of their retirement. An America where every parent knows that their child will get an education that leads them to a good job and a bright horizon. And unlike the president, I have a plan to create 12 million new jobs. Paul Ryan and I have five steps. First, by 2020, North America will be energy independent by taking full advantage of our oil, our coal, our gas, our nuclear, and our renewables.
Second, we'll give our fellow citizens the skills they need for the jobs of today and the careers of tomorrow. When it comes to the school your child will attend, every parent should have a choice and every child should have a chance. Third, we'll make trade work for America by forging new trade agreements. And when nations cheat in trade, there will be unmistakable consequences. And fourth, to assure every entrepreneur and every job creator that their investments in America will not vanish, as have those in Greece, we will cut the deficit and put America on track to a balanced budget. And fifth, we will champion small businesses, America's engine of job growth. That means reducing taxes on business, not raising them. It means simplifying and modernizing the regulations that hurt small business the most. And it means that we must rein in the skyrocketing cost of health care by repealing and replacing Obamacare. Today, women are more likely than men to start a business. They need a president who respects and understands what they do. And let me make this very clear. Unlike President Obama, I will not raise taxes on the middle class of America. As president, I'll protect the sanctity of life. I'll honor the institution of marriage. And I will guarantee America's first liberty, the freedom of religion. President Obama promised to begin to slow the rise of the oceans. <laughs> and to heal the planet. My promise is to help you and your family. I will begin my presidency with a jobs tour. President Obama began his presidency with an apology tour. <laughs> America, he said, had dictated to other nations. No, Mr. President, America has freed other nations from dictators. Every American. Every American was relieved the day President Obama gave the order and SEAL Team 6 took out Osama bin Laden. On another front, every American is less secure today because he has failed to slow Iran's nuclear threat. In his first TV interview as president, he said we should talk to Iran. We're still talking, 
in Iran's centrifuges are still spinning. President Obama has thrown allies like Israel under the bus, even as he has relaxed sanctions on Castro's Cuba. He abandoned our friends in Poland by walking away from our missile defense commitments. But he's eager, eager to give Russia's President Putin the flexibility he desires after the election. <laughs> Under my administration, our friends will see more loyalty, and Mr. Putin will see a little less flexibility and more backbone. We will honor America's democratic ideals because a free world is a more peaceful world. This is the bipartisan foreign policy legacy of Truman and Reagan. And under my presidency, we will return to it once again. You might have asked yourself if these last years are really the America we want. the America that was won for us by the greatest generation. Does the America we want borrow a trillion dollars from China? No. Does it fail to find the jobs that are needed for 23 million people and for half the kids graduating from college? No. Are those schools lagging behind the rest of the developed world? No. And does America that we want succumb to resentment and division among Americans? The America we all know has been a story of the many becoming one, uniting to preserve liberty, uniting to build the greatest economy in the world, uniting to save the world from unspeakable darkness. Everywhere I go in America, there are monuments that list those who have given their lives for America. There's no mention of their race, their party affiliation, or what they did for a living. They lived and died under a single flag, fighting for a single purpose. They pledged allegiance to the United States of America. That America, that united America, can unleash an economy that will put Americans back to work, that will once again lead the world with innovation and productivity, and that will restore every father and mother's confidence that their children's future is brighter even than the past. That America, that united America, will preserve a military that's so strong no sh nation would ever dare to test it. <laughs> that America, that America, that united America will uphold the constellation of rights that were endowed by our Creator and codified in our Constitution. That united America will care for the poor and the sick, will honor and respect the elderly, and will give a helping hand to those in need. That America is the best within each of us. That America we want for our children. If I'm elected President of these United States, I will work with all my energy and soul to restore that America, to lift our eyes to a better future. That future is our destiny. That future is out there. It is waiting for us. Our children deserve it. Our nation depends on it. The peace and freedom of the world require it. And with your help, we will deliver it. Let us begin that future for America tonight. Thank you so very much. May God bless you. May God bless the American people. And may God bless the United States of America. And there was Mitt Romney delivering, we hate to say this because it sounds so cliche, but the most important speech thus far in his political career. He came out in something of an unusual manner, walked through the crowd, shook hands, now taking in their applause.
you got a number of very solid applause lines there. And Rick, what I thought was really noticeable about this speech was the fact that he came out not with a bare fist, but really a velvet glove. This was a message really that said, Barack Obama, there's the we team. Angry. Paul just, Ryan coming yeah. out to greet him on stage. Yep. This was not it. It's, there we go. For the first time now, officially the nominees of their party. This was the story of his candidacy. The rationale for his candidacy told through the foundations of his biography. A powerful speech. An important speech. A measured speech as we see the balloons begin to fall here in Tampa. And, and as we discussed with so many of the folks that were on our show earlier, here are the wives now coming out to stand with their husbands and of course get some balloons and maybe some confetti in their hair. But you know, as we discussed earlier, Rick, this speech was, as we expected, it was solid, it was substantive, but it was not, there was nothing surprising in it. and. Uh, there was nothing that was uh, particularly something. Nothing that's particularly stood out. It wasn't an angry speech. No, it, it was it, very. Yep. It was an indictment of the Obama presidency. Yep. But it, it, it wrapped around Mitt Romney's biography, as we see the legions of kids and grandkids come onto the stage now. That is some. That is some voting block in uh, 15 years or so. That's the picture, Mitt Romney hugging his sons his grandchildren, Paul Ryan with his children about the same age as many of Romney's grandchildren. I was struck, Amy, by the fact that he didn't feel the need to make this an anti-Obama speech, yep. letting the facts largely speak for themselves, laying out the case against Obama, but doing it at the same time, Amy, that he was talking about the only reason that he'd be running for this, for this office. The policy prescriptions came toward the end. Yep. They came fast and furious toward the end as he went through energy independence, as he went through foreign policy only briefly, went through financial security, spending and debt, but cast himself really as among the disappointed. Yeah, and to say, you know, to, to those Walmart moms and suburban and exurban voters out there who voted for Barack Obama in 2008, he's saying to them, you know what, you guys, you did nothing wrong by picking Barack Obama in 2008. He told you he was going to do a lot of things. We all believed him. At one point he said probably that the day you were the most proud of Barack Obama was the day he was elected. But since then he hasn't lived up to the job. Let me go ahead and do it. I know I have the skill set. I've done it before. And uh, let, let me take those reins over. And now we see uh, my favorite, of course, is watching how the kids react to the balloons. One of the grandsons now jumping in to off the stage to grab it looks like as many balloons as he possibly can and I'll tell you what when I was six or seven that's exactly what I would have done too so I don't give him I give him a lot of credit for getting up there and as we discussed earlier there are waves of balloons now that are coming down yeah there's still several several, several large batches still big. there see some of the larger balloons falling now a lot of this about the picture that you see on the television screen a picture that you'll see in your morning newspaper surrounded by red, white, and blue. But Amy, I think you hit on something important there. This was a speech where Mitt Romney cast himself not as a partisan Republican, yep. but as one of those swing state voters, one of those moderate voters, someone who's disappointed in the yep. Romney presidency. When he said that he had hoped that the Romney presidency would succeed, he's speaking directly to people who cast that ballot four years ago. He knows he needs them to switch over. Yes. Could not have been more explicit in that appeal. No, I agree. I agree. And uh, I want to bring uh, bring on, we have two folks sitting with us today who know a little something about presidential politics because they worked for some presidential candidates. Uh, uh, the, the family sitting up there listening to America the Beautiful. I want to bring in Alice Stewart and Hogan Gidley, both uh, working for other candidates in the 2012 primaries. Let's get your first reaction to the speech and how well, how well or not well you thought he did? Well, I think you hit it on the head. It was a velvet glove, but mm -hmm. and that's Romney's style. He was, he was likable and personable, but I think what we also heard that a lot of folks have been hoping for are some anecdotes about him. We heard about his parents and his father leaving the roads for his mother. We heard about him 
uh, wanting to coach or coaching his kids. We heard about the kids piling in the bed, but we also heard about he wasn't direct and harsh and critical right. of Obama, but he said, look, we didn't get the, 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 uh, what we were promised. You know, he broke a lot of promises. But then he also laid out his business success with Bain and, and his private sector successes. And then he outlined his, outlined his plan for the future, his, his five-step plan for a better middle class. And that's exactly what we needed tonight. And you can see, you guys are, are as journalists, being professional. But you can see a lot of the folks here are taking it all in. And this is exactly what the party needed. We need to hear from, from our leader. And this gave all these folks here just what they needed to get out there and make phone calls and knock on doors. Hogan, what did you make of the tone? It, it, it wasn't nearly as partisan as most of the speeches we hear on the campaign trail these days. Right. You know, I mean, <clears throat> Governor Romney had to make the sell tonight, right? I mean, it was up to him to make that final sell. We talked about uh, earlier this week how everyone else was kind of plugging in the gaps. And, and being that attack dog for Mitt Romney, I think he made the sell. And I'll, I'll tell you, I've never been a... Yeah, I'm trying to be as nonpartisan as I can here <laughs> with, with, my, with my love for Mitt Romney. I mean, I like the guy. He's okay. I thought he did extremely well tonight. It, it, um, he was he humanized himself. He talked about his family life, yeah. something people wanted to hear. B but he also, he, a velvet glove's a good way to put it, but, I mean, you know, how could be so good at, at destroying you and smiling while he does it and so you don't realize you're being destroyed? I thought Romney did a really good job, and I think one of the things that's so damaging to the Democrats, he touched on and he said, look, I was for the guy, too. I was excited about this. I was ready for hope and change. But, guys, that's just not what we got. And I think that is the most damaging line for many independents but because it gives those independents an out to say, this time, you know, I was for him, too. I thought he was good, too. I thought he was going to do all these wonderful things, and he didn't deliver. And that's not a, a knock against him personally. It's just he didn't deliver. All right, so the question that Alice is, can he keep that message going for the next, I think we're up to 67 days, when you know that the campaign trail does not allow you to just keep your keep focused on your message every minute of the day well and that's the great thing about the Romney campaign and we experience that firsthand no matter how many uh, rats the Obama campaign tries to throw they're not going to go chase that down, down that hole they do stick to message they've always uh, stayed on jobs in the economy no matter what uh, what else is going on really in the news they stick with jobs in the economy and I think Clint Eastwood hit a good note too. We've heard a few times this week about the grandiose of four years ago of the Greek columns and that night. It was it was great. It tugged at the heartstrings, but we didn't get the hope and change we wanted. We got we got dis, uh, division and distraction. And and as as Clint Eastwood said, but Alice, do you think the Republican base heard what they needed to hear out of him as well? You know, he hasn't done everything to consolidate all of that support quite yet. There's still a lot of folks in this room that are lukewarm. I think one great message that he hit on tonight, and it was probably one of the largest applauses we heard all night, was how important women are in his personal life and in this uh, economy and in this election cycle. He said Anne had the hardest job of all in the entire family. No matter what he was doing, she had the hardest job. We talked about all the women in all of his uh, in his administration and, ha and has he's led, and he reinforced with women that are are curious about that that he values what they do at home and in the workforce and that's that was a key message that he right. needed to, to say tonight all right so Hogan we have to touch upon the one really odd thing about tonight right usually these these conventions are so scripted every single speech has been scrubbed looked at by the Romney campaign sure. we had a mystery guest everybody was really excited about the mystery guest Clint Eastwood comes on the stage the speech seemed a little um Odd. A little bit odd, <laughs> a little off. Yeah. So, so does it? Are we gonna? Are we gonna be talking about this tomorrow, or is 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 this this the thing that will really dominate? I think we'll talk about. We'll, we'll be talking about Romney's speech tomorrow. I mean, he's obviously the the main event. I think uh, Clint did a wonderful job, kind of getting the crowd excited. He had a few jokes, probably a little more crass for some people's taste, but people were excited about him. They wanted to see this mystery guest, and it was someone like Clint Eastwood, who's known in. In, in um, all the households as being a tough guy, a smart guy. He, he, he directs and produces wonderful movies. Yeah, he does, uh, but, 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 but come on. It was that, a, that, it, that, that was, there, not, was that the message they wanted? Well, that, it, was, it was a little odd, but, but regardless, it, it ginned up the crowd. They got excited, and it delivered uh, Mitt Romney, who came in and, and, and 
Clint Eastwood set him up. Romney knocked him down. All right, Alice Stewart and Hogan Gidley, we thank you for your analysis here in the booth. I know you both were hoping to be here under other circumstances working for different <laughs> candidates. No, no we doubt. appreciate your perspective, as always. Thanks. We're going to go now to the floor of the Tampa Bay. And Koki Roberts is joining us. Koki, I hope you haven't drowned in balloons. What's the sight <laughs> like down there as we see the confetti ball? Well, it's a fabulous sight, but actually I'm, I'm on the podium, so I, I'm sort of looking at it in the same way that the candidates would be looking at it, were they still here. And in fact, just this second, one of the little Romney grandchildren was having a little bit of a, a tantrum on the stage because he didn't want to leave. His mother had to grab him and take him off. But uh, it is a great sight. There's lots of confetti and lots of uh, balloons and lots of balls. These balls are all... Uh, covered with stars and people are bouncing them around around um, you know I could see the teleprompter while Clint Eastwood was out on the stage and it was blank he was making that up as he went along and I suspect that the, the Romney uh, family would not be particularly happy with it. Uh, Koki, tell us the, what, what do you think, uh, just give us your very quick analysis, what you thought about that speech, did it do what you think it needed to do? I think that he, he certainly um, made a start. He started to talk more about who he is in a way that made a difference and talking about his family. Uh, the, there was not a dry eye in the house when he said that his mother learned that his father had died by, because the rose that George Romney brought her every day was not there that morning. You could hear a real catch of breath on that. Um, and then, of course, uh, he did get them fired up against President Obama and then gave them something uh, to look for in his administration. Do, have, are they leaving here loving him? I don't think so. That didn't seem to be, they, they did not jump up out of their seats through the speech and all that. But are they leaving here ready to go out and work for him? Absolutely. And, uh, and I think ready to hear more from him as the campaign goes forward. All right, ABC's Koki Roberts, get out safe. There's a lot of balloons around there. It looks, looks like it'd be dangerous. We're joined now back here in the booth with, by Matthew Dowd, a uh, longtime political consultant. Matthew, your take here on this speech, uh, it didn't strike me as, as overtly partisan. It seemed like he was he had a much different message tailored to a different kind of uh, kind of audience. What were your thoughts? Well, I think it, adapting some of what Paul Ryan said yesterday, it seems that they've settled on the gold watch strategy that you normally happens to CEOs that haven't run a company, which is we like the guy, we <laughs> hoped he had done a good job, we're going to give him a gold watch and send him on his way. And that's what they seem to be doing in part. He obviously ended it a slightly more negative. I'm with Koki on this. I think his main goal of this speech had to be from moving this crowd and the undecided voters from people that didn't like Barack Obama to people that liked and wanted and were pro Romney. And I don't know. I think they did a great. The stagecraft was okay. I mean, I'm sure we've all talked about the Clint Eastman moment was slightly unscripted, and I don't know if the campaign how they're going to and they're going to have to deal with that unscripted moment that came out. But I think the still question that we cannot answer is. Is he moved this from anti-Obama to pro-Romney? And challengers have to have it pro before they can win the election. Yeah, I, I, that's a very good point, and I don't know that that did it there. Is it the debates, though, where that really drives home that message more so than a, than a convention speech? Well, it, it's, it's, we all know that uh, campaigns are about multi-chaptered storybooks, and you have to build it until you get to election day, until you get to the conclusion. You can't jump to the conclusion. It, debates are very important. They can be very important and part of the equation. But what you don't want to do as a campaign is keep saying, we'll do it at the next thing. And we'll do it at the next one. And we'll do it at the third debate. And we'll, you know, you don't want to get in the situation where you said, losing ground. Yeah. You keep counting the days and you say, oh, we'll just go over there and do it there. We'll do it that next week. And, and I think they might have missed an opportunity tonight to make that movement more pronounced. And, and Matthew, finally here. We, we know that he had to address uh, items of his biography, his Mormon faith. How did he do it today? Was he doing it in a way that, that, that related to the person maybe tuning in for the first time trying to make up their minds? I thought the best 
part of his speech and the thing that I think you could feel it in the crowd and you could you could you know it connected with an audience was the part about his his family, his children, his wife, his mom, his dad, and the part about his church and what they've done and what that means to him and his faith. He didn't have to explain the tenets of Mormonism to satisfy people, but I think that idea that have a community of faith that comes together and helps people, I think was a very powerful message. All right, ABC's Matthew Dow, we appreciate you being with us, hanging with us throughout this convention, and uh, see you in Charlotte. Yep, see you yeah. in stop. Quick no turnaround. Stops. Well, we've... Um, We've been checking it. We've decided to check in tonight with some people who were in contact throughout this, doing Google Hangouts uh, with some friends, with some neighbors, trying to uh, decide how they came down on this. We want to start by checking in with Renee Seiler, who uh, spent some time with moms over the last uh, over the last couple of hours. And Renee, what was the takeaway in, the, in your Google Hangout? What was the the most predominant theme that you heard about uh, the evening's festivities here? Uh, well, I would say, Rick, the most um, prominent thing was that people were saying that, the people in my chat were saying that they still were not convinced. They still didn't see what they wanted to see to make them sway know, can't, um, their decisions or their, or their minds. They didn't feel like um, they saw a Romney uh, this, uh, this night, in this particular time, that was any different from the Romney that they've seen up until this point. And they wanted to see more. They also wanted to say that, you know, the biggest issue in their minds was about the economy. Although one of the people in my hangout said that she felt like reproductive rights were very, very important. So we had a very diverse uh, group in our hangout. Somebody who is with a group of Latino voters, Emily Duray, uh, who's in Washington. She's a reporter for Univision News. Why don't you tell us about uh, the feedback you got from your hangout? Hi, yeah, we talked a lot about immigration, a lot about what the future of immigration might look like. There are a lot of questions about deferred action, the uh, program that lets undocumented youth apply to stay in the country for a period of two years, or renewable period of two years, and what the future of that is. Um, Romney hasn't made clear what he would do with that in the future, and that was a big question, and he hasn't answered that yet. And, and was there any sense of, of speaking to issues that, that, that particularly relate to young people? To young people, absolutely. Um, we talked about the, the DREAM Act and um, whether that would be passed or not. And everybody in my hangout wants that to, to pass. Um, we talked to conservatives and more liberal voters, and they're all hoping for, for a more permanent solution, and they were all supportive of the DREAM Act. All right, Emily Dory, thank you for, for checking in. We're going to now whip around to Joan Gary, who is the uh, the former executive director of Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders and also worked on the, the 2008 Obama campaign in the finance world. And, and what was the takeaway among your friends and neighbors on Google? Was there anything in this speech that really stu st stuck out to your mind? Well, we had a pretty diverse group of people uh, in our group, including a couple of Democrats, a couple of Republicans, all LGBT. We took a poll before the, before the hangout began, and we said, how many of you believe that, uh, that um, Romney will talk about any social issues at all? And we unanimously agreed that he would steer clear of every single one of them. So what we actually ended up talking about, frankly, was about what he did not talk about, rather than what he did talk about. We also talked about the log cabin Republicans and the kind of move they have made and the kind of push that they have made to try to move the GOP into a place that's actually commensurate with the 21st century. The ground is shifting and the GOP is painfully out of step. Uh, we also talked about what, um, what um, Romney didn't talk about, about people of color, about women, of course about LGBT people. And we talked a lot about the issue of truth telling and conventions and what we talked right. about well, one thing we talked about was this notion of conventions being like the Wizard of Oz, and that Toto pulls, a, pulls apart that, that, um, that screen, and behind that screen is the GOP platform. And that's not anything we heard anything about. An amendment right. proposing right. constitutional Good. amendment for, uh, for marriage right. equality. And right. Paul Ryan, who votes for votes against fairness right, and equity Joan. for LGBT people. That's All right, the Joan, kind of stuff that's we Joan, need to Joan hear Gary. Joan Gary, really appreciate it. We'll be checking in uh, throughout throughout the, the week next right. week as well. And, and, uh, and we have our final group now, the Millennials, the so-called Generation Y, Tiffany Dina Lofton. 
coming uh, to us. She graduated from UC Santa Cruz, lives in D.C. Tell us what those younger voters were thinking about after they watched that speech. Well, we had a really interesting conversation. There were folks from Oklahoma, Utah, a student who went to Stanford. Um, and we were talking a lot about jobs, which we know uh, Mitt Romney covered a lot of. Um, but then also this issue around student loan debt, which still hasn't been solved. There are a lot of private organizations and private companies who have predatory lending practices, and we're trying to figure out how we're going to regulate those moving forward in the future. We talked also about the um, federal GM Act and that being a fight that students have been fighting for for the last decade almost, um, and how close that wants to be and deferred action and those steps moving. We talked about increasing the Pell Grant and making sure that Pell Grant Funding is mandatory moving into the next couple of years because students really benefit on that source of funding to be able to access and afford higher education. And then lastly, we talked about um, uh, work study, actually, in, in school, um, fair enough. And so we talked a little bit about religion and what role that plays in the campaign moving forward. Uh, students in, the, in my Google Hangout talked uh, you know, a little bit about what that means for a candidate that's running and how serious students really are in this coming election. We're very, very serious. We're going to turn out to the polls. We're regi registering students around the country right now to register to vote and educating them on which candidate is going to be able to support our agenda, the students' agenda moving forward. Um, really awesome conversation and um, tuition you know, has been going up all around the country. Who's going to help and step in to make sure that the students and the young people who have to attain these jobs and the 12 million jobs that he's creating um, are actually going to be educated in the workforce? All right, Tiffany, Dina, Lofton, thank you so much for checking in. Some interesting perspectives there. Amy, as this speech, of course, reaches more people than any other single moment in the campaign. These convention speeches are important for that reason. You get to reach out to people, undecided voters, people that have already made up their mind, and communicate directly to the public. That's exactly right. And guess what? We have another convention where the other side gets to make their case to the public. That, of course, is a Democratic National Convention. It is starting next week in Charlotte. Of course, we will be there. We're going to pack up our stuff tonight, get maybe some clean underwear. That's my number one goal. And then get ourselves to Charlotte. We're going to be on live again starting at 7 o'clock, Monday through Thursday. We're going to hear from all the speakers. We're going to have great guests. Of course, you can follow us then, now, forever, on Twitter, at Amy E. Walter, at Rick Klein. And, of course, we'll have a different hashtag at Amy, that Amy, I know you're eager to get back, but I'm going to take off Monday, as you, as you will as well, for Labor Day. It's going to be Tuesday to start our live stream again at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Don't forget to check us out all along the way, at Amy E. Walter, at Rick Klein. Keep us hashtagged at 2012 GOP. We'll have a new hashtag to line up next week. In the meantime, enjoy some sights and sounds from Tampa Bay. Thanks for watching. I've been so blessed to be part of a family that has committed its life to public service. My brother, well, I love my brother. He is a man of integrity, courage, and honor. And during incredibly challenging times, he kept us safe. So Mr. President, it is time to stop blaming your predecessor for your failed economic policies. Save a little for Mitt. We own this country. Whether you're Democrat or whether you're a pro Republican or whether you're Libertarian or whatever, you're the best and we should not ever forget that. And we, when somebody does not do the job, we got to let them go. Go ahead. The problem with President Obama isn't that he's a bad person. Our problem is that he's a bad president. Because his new slogan for his campaign is the word forward. These ideas don't move us forward. These ideas move us backwards. Under Barack Obama, the only change is that hope is hard to find. My fellow Americans, I am proud to introduce to you the next President of the United States of America, Mitt Romney. Mr. Chairman and delegates, I accept your nomination for President of the United States.
It's the genius of the American free enterprise system to harness the extraordinary creativity and talent and industry of the American people with a system that's dedicated to creating tomorrow's prosperity, not trying to redistribute today's. President Obama promised to begin to slow the rise of the oceans and to heal the planet. My promise is to help you and your family. If I'm elected president of these United States, I will work with all my energy and soul to restore that America, to lift our eyes to a better future. That future is our destiny. That future is out there. It is waiting for us. Our children deserve it. Our nation depends on it. The peace and freedom of the world require it. And with your help, we will deliver it. Let us begin that future for America tonight. Thank you so very much. May God bless you. May God bless the American people. And may God bless the United States of America.